Did you see the wet kisses uh, passed between Xi and Putin? That's serious business, ladies and gentlemen. That's not a joke. Serious business. As pointed out in foreign policy, Chinese President Xi Jinping's decision to visit Moscow in his first trip abroad since his re-election comes as no surprise to those who have been watching carefully. When one steps back and analyzes the relationship between China and Russia, the brute facts cannot be denied. Along every dimension, personal, economic, military, and diplomatic, the undeclared alliance that Xi has built with Russian President Vladimir Putin has become much more consequential than most of the United States official alliances today. The greatest threat we have is China. It's not Russia, it's not Iran, it's not North, it's China. That's like saying before World War II, but at the precipice, the greatest threat we face is Italy, but not Japan and Germany. This is a complete lack of knowledge of what's taking place here. China is on the move. China is not uh, fortress China. China is globalist China. And they're building alliances with Russia for a reason, alliances with Iran for a reason, alliances with North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and other countries for a reason. So while we're pulling in and pulling back and decimating our own military with the uh, with the guy in the White House and so forth, and why we have a Putin wing even within the Republican Party and so forth, China's on the move. And the greatest threat that we face as a country is the inability to wake up to what the hell's going on here and pretend that we can parse out these countries and all the rest. We have a mess on our hands. And in order to remind you, in order to remind you, I thought we would turn to one of the greatest presidents in American history and one of the most successful politically, geopolitically, militarily, and economically, Ronald Reagan. Go. Now, let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? When Nikita Khrushchev has told his people, he knows what our answer will be. He has told them that we are retreating under the pressure of the Cold War, and someday, when the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary, because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side, he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than dead, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. The great Ronald Reagan, who defeated the Soviet Union, who took on the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, in Angola, in Nicaragua, took on the Soviet Union throughout the Middle East. They had an awful lot of nuclear weapons then, too. They were a lot more powerful than you can see Russia today. What do you think Reagan would have said about Ukraine? Well, it's none of our business. Is that what you think he would have said? But Angola was? Things have been turned upside down. 
and it's very troubling to me, particularly in the face of what is taking place. People who say that this is just a territorial battle in Ukraine, or people who say we have no business supporting our ally in Ukraine, and people who say, well, our real battles with China, not with Russia, they don't understand. Our battle is with an alliance that has been built, an access that is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Cherry picking one country or the other misses the strategic point. The strategic point is the reason why Xi is building these alliances and partnering with these countries financially and militarily is because he wants to defeat us. And at the same time, we have voices from within, both parties that are undermining us, that are giving the enemy, I think, aid and comfort with their Tokyo Rose type propaganda. That's not American first. That's American last. And it's going to get your kids and grandkids into a horrific war. Now, let me give you some examples of what's taking place here. While we're talking about withdrawing, while we're talking about why do we have all these bases everywhere? Foreign Affairs magazine, China's Latin America power grab. Remember we had the Monroe Doctrine? The Monroe Doctrine, under James Madison, but Secretary Monroe. The Monroe Doctrine says of what happens in our hemisphere, in so many words, is our business. It was abandoned by Obama. It was reinstated by Donald Trump. Donald Trump is no pacifist. Donald Trump is no isolationist. Donald Trump doesn't cut and run. Look at the history of his presidency. He's enormously successful foreign policy. Much like Reagan, peace through strength. China's footprint in Latin America is large and growing. It is the region's second largest trade partner after the United States and the biggest sovereign lender to Latin American governments. Indeed, as a lender, China is overtaking long-standing multinational, multilateral financial institutions such as the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank in the region. Those two organizations are just barely edging out the $131 billion the Chinese extended in credit to Latin American between 2008 and 2019. That should worry both Latin America and the United States. What do you think they're up to? They're building bases in Latin America, ground bases and water bases. And what else are they doing in Latin America? The U.S. and China are battling for influence in Latin America, our own backyard. Globally, the lines of a new Cold War are gaining definition. The U.S., Europe, India, and Pacific allies on one side, China, Russia, Pakistan, Central and Southeast Asia on the other. It's not yet clear where the Silk Curtain will fall in Latin America, but Beijing's activity has Washington spooked. It should. Both sides of the Panama Canal are now managed by the Communist Chinese. How the hell did that happen? DW, China eyes closer ties with Brazil during the Lula visit. Lula is called a socialist. In my view, he's a Marxist. He's the new president of Brazil, which is a massive country, as you know, in South America. Chinese leader Xi Jinping is hosting Brazil's president in Beijing today, Sunday seeking to deepen ties with another diplomatic ally following his three-day visit to Russia that took place earlier this week. The state visits come at a time when China is trying to present itself as an important global power that can rival the United States. China now invests in a wide range of sectors in Brazil, and experts say Beijing wants to tap into the South American country's rich resources and market size. The Monroe Doctrine was surrendered by the Democrats. There's a gap. And the communist Chinese moved right in. It's just unbelievable. Africa. This from AfricaNews.com. Africa facing Chinese and Russian influence. By multiplying the heavy infrastructure projects in Africa, China and Russia aim to establish their influence of the continent, which risked their part to find themselves trapped, warn experts, trapped. Railway lines and civil infrastructure. China's multiplying gigantic projects in cooperation with African states of which it is becoming one of the main donors. A lot of these African countries are in great debt, and a lot of them are led by dictators and corrupt families. 
One in three major infrastructure projects in Africa, one in three is built by Chinese state-owned companies. One in five is financed by a Chinese institutional bank, says Paul Nantulia of the African Center for Strategic Studies, who, uh, who does reports for the Defense Department. Beijing is taking advantage of the void left by the withdrawal of Western countries, which are more hesitant to finance these projects. The Chinese saw this void and decided to invest in infrastructure, remarks Mr. Nantulia. Wow. I thought we were the warmongers and the globalists. Singapore. Reuters, U.S. and China wage war beneath the waves over Internet cables. It started out as a, a strictly business, a huge private contract for one of the world's most advanced underseas fiber optic cables. These are critical. It became a trophy in a growing proxy war between the United States and China over technologies that can determine who achieves economic and military dominance for decades to come. Another, Australia, Philippines, discussed joint South China Sea patrols to counter China's aggressive activities. The Philippines and Australia have discussed pursuing joint patrols in the South China Sea days after the Southeast Asian country held similar talks with the United States on the need to counter China's assertiveness in the strategic waterway. On Tuesday, the Philippine Coast Guard aircraft flew over the South China Sea as part of efforts to boost its presence, but they were met with the Communist Chinese Coast Guard. Want to hear more? The Philippines confronts China diplomats over sea disputes, and this happened a few days ago. Filipino diplomats confronted Chinese officials in closed doors talks with a slew of protests over China's aggressive behavior in the South China Sea. Territorial disputes in the busy waterway have long loomed as a potential flashpoint in Asia. Ooh, don't look. Don't look. Don't even think about it. Has nothing to do with us. Radio Free Asia, Chinese ships swarming Vietnamese waters, think tank says. After finishing with the Philippines, Chinese maritime militia and fishing boats apparently swarmed inside Vietnam's exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea. Uh, according to the SCSCI, the South China Sea Chronicle Initiative, the number of Chinese vessels in the economic zone increased measurably in the first two weeks of this March, almost tripling the number of observed at the end of February. The Chinese vessels have also been operating deep inside Vietnam's zone, up to just 60 nautical miles from its coast. Oh, look at this one. China firm wins Solomon Islands port project as Australia watches. Remember the uh, Guadalcanal? My great uncle fought at Guadalcanal. Well, that's part of the Solomon Islands. Reuters, this is last week. Solomon Islands has awarded a multi-million dollar contract to a Chinese company to upgrade an international port in Hanyera in a project funded by the Asian Development Bank. The United States and its allies, including Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, have held concerns that China has ambitions to build a naval base in the region since the Solomon Islands struck a security pact with Beijing last year. You want to hear more? Well, I don't have time for more. Bases on the west coast of Africa. Now they cut a deal with Iran in Saudi Arabia. Now Iran is relying on China for technology and so forth, as China is relying on Iranian oil. Saudi Arabia, which had been a putative ally of ours, is now working with the Iranians and the Communist Chinese and the Russians. The whole Middle East picture is changing. And where's Biden? Biden's putting pressure on Israel. Where's Biden? A day late and a dollar short with Ukraine. So many Republicans running for president are complaining that we are stretched too far. Well, we're not stretched at all. Where is the Reagan of our time? Where's the Thatcher of our time? Where's the Brian Mulroney of Canada of our time? Where's the John Paul II of our time? Where's the Helmut Kohl of our time? Where's the Churchill of our time? Where are they? because we need them desperately. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.